We're live. It's happening. We are live. We're, gonna... Gonna... We're not going to say, are we live? We no. just are live. live. We are live. <laughs> hey, guys, welcome to... <laughs> Hi, guys, welcome to VCQ Live. Dan here. Mick here. Hello, and welcome on this blustery Monday afternoon in the UK. It is blowing a hooli. Um I had a shocking trip down. Storm... Kiria. Career, 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 career. You know they all have names now. Right. Yeah. Um, they do all have names. How's the framing, Fraser? Is it straight? You, you, you don't want to change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit wonky. Come on, a bit wonky. Oh, there we go. Less Happy. Wonky. Less wonky. Less wonky. Um, right, let's get into it. Um, for those of us joining us on the chat, sorry, Robbie Rose has just said Who? that Robbie Rose has just said the Church of Man Love is such a holy place to be. <laughs> I love that. That's great. We welcome you. Yes, uh, my welcome. children, um, <laughs> dearly beloved, and all that. Uh, for those of you joining us on chat, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we don't look at the chat. Dan's not looking at the chat. No. Until we've answered the questions that came in over the YouTube comments over the weekend. Uh, so we'll we'll run through those first, and that usually takes about twenty minutes. Fraser, can I grab that stool? I'll put the. We're having a slight storm malfunction, so let's get into it. Friday's video was ten ways to use boost pedals in your rig, um, and I, 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 I learned something. Before we got to that video, though, we had your vlog, and I must say, it was epic. Thanks, Dan. I loved it. I did the first, first well, not the first, the follow-up of the Strat Vlogs, which has been about a year in the making. No, it took about six hours to make, but it's been a year coming. So, yeah. It was awesome. It, it was really, thank really Thank you, wonderful. and it's really interesting, and there's much more of that to come. So if you like that kind of stuff, keep your eyes on the channel. There'll be more things in the coming weeks. I have to up my vlog game now, because yours just it looked and sounded and everything just... Well, I do have the benefits of the TPS Studio, Daniel. Yeah, but, you know... It's no excuse. I'm not going to use that as, as an excuse. I have to lift my game. <laughs> it's so, video is so frustrating. It is frustrating. I've been doing video since... Uh, when did I get my first f video camera? Probably in about 2000 and... Well, a long time ago anyway. Right. And still, still every video one makes, you look at it and go... But you must have stuck to the vlog and gone, no. No, I hate the colour correction. Ah, oh, get out. Skin tones are all off. Get out. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. See, I look at, I look, I look at everything I turn and go, yeah, man, you're doing really good. <laughs> See, that's the difference between you and me. I am, I am, no, I'm not the glass half full. I'm a little bit of moisture on the inside. I'm going, yeah, look, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, good enough is never good enough. Was oh, always, no, no. I had that kicked into me ever since the day I walked into my first publishing job. Right. Good enough is not good enough. Okay. From day one. And I, I, I carry those scars. I know lots of publishing people that don't think like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Moving Just on. Right, yeah. Any, anyway, yeah. anyway, it was epic. Publish. Thank That's you, mate. Moving yeah, on. There we go. Ten ways to use boost pedals in your rig. Um, and this show was really about gain stacking, it wasn't was. it? It was. Gain stacking and understanding headroom. My favourite comments that came in over the... Uh, over YouTube over the weekend were, um, so where shall I put my game pedal? <laughs> so if you ask that question, we're not answering <laughs> those questions now because that's what the whole video is about. The whole video about how to use a game, a boost pedal and where to put it. And where do I put my boost pedal? Just the video, whole video. The whole video, like an hour and five minutes <laughs> on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's kick off with Christopher Vad. Christopher says, um, for an 11th way, Christopher Ort knew all the first 10. Right. So for the 11th way, I use a boost in my wet-dry setup to level out the volume difference between the dry and the wet oh, amp. Oh, very nice. Which has more headroom than the dry. The wet amp has more headroom than the dry and as such is significantly louder when boosted by drive pedals. I put that in because that is a brilliant, brilliant point. Great. It's really, really cool. Yeah. And if you don't understand that, if you've got uh, a, a one amp that's got higher headroom and one that's got lower headroom, when you step on an overdrive pedal that's hitting both of those amps, the amp with the higher headroom is going to go boom and yeah. get really loud. So he's saying he uses the boost to level that out a bit. 
Very good. Again, it's just ga game stacking, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 When you go to school and they teach you like A, B, C, and one, two, three, they should also teach you the basics of game stacking. They I should. Think. And finance. Yeah. Game stacking and finance. So the rest yeah. will take care of itself. Yeah, and a bit of philosophy. Some, so yes. some sociology. A bit of conversation, a bit of, you know, human interaction. Human interaction, communication. Yeah, all those things. Yeah. Yeah, just before you're five there. Um, Mark Gray. Hey guys, greetings from Stillwater, Maine, USA. I hope MN is Maine, and if it's not, I'm really sorry. Uh, MN, wherever that is. Man and Newt. It's not Manstitutes, is um, it? Or um, Minnesippi. Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ah, Milwaukee. <laughs> Um, please let us know if MN is indeed main. Uh, I've recently watched your boost voltage and compressor videos. It got me thinking about how my exotic SP compressor can run at 9 or 18 volts. Minanota? Ah, Minanota, yeah, nice. Um, <laughs> with the touted benefit of increasing headroom and reducing compression at 18 volts. Come on, it's staying again. <laughs> sorry, <down>. sorry. Uh, <sighs> what impact does this have on compression? Should I think about it as increasing the maximum threshold? Uh, or is it the maximum signal that can take before clipping? So Mark is asking, Mark Gray is asking, when you go, when you take a compressor from nine to 18 volts, what's it actually doing? It, it's not a uh, blanket statement. For example, if your compressor has got uh, larger electrolytic capacitors, so it'll handle the 18 volts, um, but in reality, in the design, they've got everything clamped down to five volts. You know, things are regulated down to five volts. Then putting 18 volts in is not going to make any difference Makes whatsoever. No difference, yeah. However, if um, if that voltage translates through to, um, you know, like if you've got a transistors or op amps or whatever's doing the amplification and it can handle the extra voltage, then you may find that you have more headroom before clipping. Um, it all depends on the design. See, it's, it's really weird. Like with the, um, the compressors uh, that I use, the guys from uh, Origin, Origin, and I much prefer mine at 9 volts because at 18 volts, it's, I've got to work a lot harder to get it to compress, mm. you know. And so I've got to drive it a lot harder. Now that can be cool. My favorite sound is just nine volts. And most guys, they're not designing these things. Uh, if they were designing it to sound great at 18 volts, they'd give you an 18 volt supply. Um, I think um, maybe we need to look at that again, but I think much too, uh, much too much attention has been given to this. Oh, if I put 18 volts in, it's going to sound twice as good. It doesn't, it doesn't translate like that. No, we did a show on uh, voltage in pedals and we discovered that sometimes in overdrive pedals specifically that were designed to offer you something different between 9 and 18. Yeah, yeah. 50% of people preferred 9 and 50% of people preferred 18. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, yeah, I, I would say if you, like depending on the compressor, but generally if you are adding uh, headroom to the device that's doing the compression, you're going to find it doesn't compress, the, on sort of, the, the onset of the compression doesn't happen as early as it would with a 9 volt one. It would be interesting to discuss it in, in a studio world, wouldn't it? Because let's say you've got your compressor on a bus, on an AUX mix, yep. uh, and you've got your 9 volt pedal compressor and mm -hmm. you're sticking the whole band mix through that. I wonder how that would differ compared to some mains power. I would love to do that. Uh, you know, really serious studio like a... LA2A or uh, 1176 or something. That would be an interesting experiment. I would love to do that. Actually, we need to go and see uh, Gareth. Yes, we do. We do. We definitely do. All right, um, let's let's move along. Christopher C. Um, hello, Christopher C. If you're watching, love the idea of placing a boost in the loop to overdrive the clean channel at lower volumes. We did this with the Hot Rod mm -hmm. Deluxe. Mm -hmm. I gig with a Hot Rod DeVille 3 60 watt 2x12. Nice. Which can be unbearable at times. Yeah, that's a loud amp. Um, and I've been looking into replacing it. Sticking my EP101 in the loop has completely changed the game. 
So we did it in the show where we put a boost pedal in the effects loop of the Hot Rod Deluxe, which enabled you to run the amp a bit hotter and turn the gain down in the, in the boost, uh, which made the amp run a bit harder in the front end anyway. Um, is there a downside to running your amp this way? Uh, for example, extra wear or stress on the valves? Uh, no. Only, no, only as much as turning it up would wear it more. Yeah. Um, the signal that you're putting into the valves is lower. It's, it's, it has more uh, limiting in that signal. And the character that you're hearing and you're liking is from the limiting of the signal before it hits the power valves. Yeah. Um, but yet, no problems at all. Yeah. I don't actually know where the loop is on the... Well, it's not before the power... It's not after the power valves, clearly. Yeah. Um, but because uh, you're getting the whole... You're essentially getting the master volume as well, aren't you, on the clean channel of the Hot Rod Deluxe? So you're getting the phase inverter as well? I have to have a look at it. No yeah. idea. Pre and post phase inverter EQs, uh, effects loops are a whole other topic of discussion. Anyway, no, you're not going to damage the amp. Christopher, um, David Cisbarro. Hi, guys. Question about gain stacking. If you have an amp with some headroom mm -hmm. and then a medium gain pedal, let's say a blues driver, if you hit that pedal with a cranked boost, is there any overflow of that boost signal through the blues driver into the amp, or will it just completely saturate the blues driver with no effect on the amp's volume? Depends on the pedal. Yeah, and depends how you have the pedal set. Now, just because you're going through a blues driver, if you've got the gain turned down, there's still headroom there. There's still a dynamic range there. And when you hit it with a boost, you're just going to be you know, pushing that dynamic range. If you have the gain turned up so that uh, you're limiting that dynamic range, so everything that you play has got is clipping essentially, then putting the boost in, you've, you've lessened that dynamic range. But there's no. I think what you're talking about is, um, if you have, say, something like a tube screamer that has certain frequencies, uh, are cleaner through it. There's like a, almost a parallel path. Um, and then the you know those the boost sort of goes in parallel in those frequencies you know alongside it, um, but not in the blues driver, not in most gain pedals. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, the, the, it's not actually a parallel signal. It's not path a parallel signal path. There's in the tube elements screamer. of the elements. There's frequency, there's frequency uh, elements of the EQ section that get distorted in exactly. some that don't. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it really. What he just said. It depends how gainy you have the pedal. If you have it not very gainy, um, then yeah, putting something before it can definitely lift lift the amp. It's just when it when whatever device it is you're talking about, whether it's the pedal or the amp, is kind of at the limit of its headroom, then no, it'll just get more distorted. Seeing as you mentioned tube screamers, mm -hmm. I, I, I put my um, I've got an iPod in my car and I put it on shuffle this morning. Right. And one of the songs that came on was the live version of Belief by John Mayer. Right. At the um, Nokia Theatre late 2000s show, the, the live album. Ah. And um, blimey O'Reilly, what a tube screamer sound that is. Really? Really cloaky, like all the top end rolled off, like blanket cloak. Yeah. Really, really. Do you know what the rest of his rig was? Uh, it's Two Rocks Dumbles um, is big pedal board but you know clearly is some sort of tube screamer or at least one tube screamer if not two right or the tube screamer and the clon if he had a clon at that time could be a blues driver and a tube screamer but i'll play it to you later okay really cloaky sounds great but so cloaky right is it okay you have to have listened to it. i want to hear it in context yeah, yeah. sound awesome. i loved for years but it hit me in the ears this morning going wow that's that's cloaky right where's the treble gone Funny how times change, isn't it? Um, to the okey cloaky. For anyone just joining us, we're not looking at the comments yet. We're just going through the uh, questions that have come in over the weekend in the YouTube comments because people like that, having taken the trouble to ask questions. Then Fuzzy Monster says, no, 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 no. Um, the exotic EP booster is not a replica of the Echoplex preamp. It is sonically intended to be similar, inspired by... But if you wanted to get the real circuit, it is not the one to get. If you want to get a good EP preamp, get clinch effects from Australia or tiny crank one. I think we go to, well, we always say that it's not the a replica. That's it's sonically. Yeah. The the implication is that it's a replica. I think when we use it, but 
um, you know, it's designed to sound a bit like it. Yeah, and a lot of people love it, but yeah. there are some, yeah. So, and uh, the the um, preamp in the Echo Fix is very close to a, an EP Pre. There's a show we've got to do, Dan, because I've had a bit of a disappointing discovery over the last couple of days. Right. I don't want to sing, single out Catlin bread, but okay, that's what's going to happen. Right. Um, but for this, insert every other tape echo simulation I've heard yet. So I'm listening to the echo fix going, that sounds unbelievable. So we've got to get an EP3 because I want to, I want to make sure that the EP3 sounds as unbelievable as I think it does. So I, I compared this in its bypass sound. This is a Catlin Bread Belly Pork Deluxe beloved tape delay emulator. Mm. And the Echorec drum delay mm -hmm. emulator and a bunch of others that I've got my hand on. I would like to stress, I'm not singling out Catlin Bread here. They just happen to be the first two that I put my hands on. Um, and do you know what, Dan? Tell me what, Mick. Every pedal that simulates tape delay does this. Right. You put it in its bypass state and you play, and you think, it shouldn't, there's no delay on, but I can't hear any treble in my tone. Interesting. That's what the tape machine sounds like, and this is what every simulation of it sounds like. Not quite as bad as that, but literally, turn them on and go, where's all my top end gone? Right, wow. Even with that 22 volt preamp, which is supposed to be really good. So I'd like to do a show, Dan, that pulls this to pieces. Okay. Because well, I've had an idea about this on the weekend, actually. Controversially, yes. and tell me if this chimes with your idea, mm -hmm. the only thing I've heard recently in the show that sounds a bit like it is the Blooming Walrus Mako Series D1 because it has fidelity. Okay. And maybe the Keeley Echoes, but I need to have a proper listen to that. They don't roll all that top off immediately because that's the sound of the preamp. Mm. And I have this real crestfallen kind of moment. So let's give these pedals the chance to redeem themselves mm -hmm. and make that show. Okay. I but we need some... to get an EP3 from somewhere. Okay. We really do. And I want to get a full tone. Yes. One That's well. probably what we'll end up with, to be honest. Okay. I think we we'll need to... I'll, I might pop down and see my dear friend Charlie Chandler. Yeah. And um, he's been very good at learning me on occasion. Learning me on occasion. He's, um, Shall we commit to buying a full tone? Yes. We absolutely should. Okay, we're going to buy a full tone. You can use the full tone. I'll have the, yeah. the Echo Fix. All right. We and just need to find one at the right price because they're too expensive new. Okay. They're like $1,800 now, oh, which is just too much. Okay. But, but they're wonderful. So maybe we find a used one somewhere. Yeah. But I, you know, you, your fuzz face, and a tape echo. I can't unhear it. Yeah. No, no. I just can't unhear it now. That's where we live. <laughs> it's like this... Doing this show, like in that sense, is like, oh man, alive, done me no favours. No, no favours whatsoever. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. You said you had an idea about that. Yeah, I do. And actual, in actual fact, it's so good, I'm not going to share it right now. <laughs> okay. Because I think, I think I've worked something out yeah. over the weekend, just looking at some tape delays and stuff. I'm going to have an experiment with it. Well, maybe we've got the new um, uh, J Rocket Ape coming. So I'm wondering if you use that with something, you can retain That's fidelity. That's going to be very interesting. You can retain, yep. retain fidelity and get a really nice delay sound. That's going to be very interesting. Okay, all right. Anyway, okay. We should do that. Um, once again, for anyone joining us, we're not looking at the comments coming in live at the Screen's moment. Screen's even gone dark. I yeah. had no idea. We're probably not even live now. We're just talking <laughs> to ourselves. We've got a few questions, a few more questions to get to, then we'll get to the comments. Um, so Chris Hilton says, question. There's no way you play with this much bass in your bands, right? It would be a muddy mess between you and the bass player. Sounds great solo, but muddy in the mix. So what Chris is saying is when he listens to the show, uh, as we put it out, he's saying our, our guitar sounds are tremendously bassy. They have a lot of bass in them. Okay. What do you think about that? Um, uh, there's... there's a full range of frequencies there from time to time. It depends on what you're doing. I think, Chris, what you're probably hearing is when we play in this room, we use two amps together. 
And the there's a largeness. <laughs> there is a significant Epicness. base coupling that happens when you put two, two amps together. Secondly, we use a, a room um, stereo, well, a mid-side configuration of room mics, and there's quite a lot of low-end resonance that comes through those. We filter most of it out, some of it, probably anything below 90 hertz-ish, 120 sometimes. So we'll filter a lot of that out, but you still get a lot of room resonance mm. in that. So what the, um, how can we say this? The balance of frequency that you probably hear sat here is somewhat different than you hear on the full recorded thing. And that's not because we're trying to deceive anyone. You're right in saying that solo guitars need a bit of a sweeter EQ to sound nice. I probably wouldn't use much less bass, but I would use quite a bit more treble. Okay. Live. Like in here, it's unusual to have the two rocks uh, bright switch on. But you always. But I never gig without it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it depends on your bass player. Yeah. I just want that big tubby mess. Yeah. I don't even want. I, I don't want to hear the thumb. <laughs> I wanted to hear bl the blowing on the strings. Yeah. 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 Ampeg SVT. Uh, Fender Precision Bass and Pino Palladino is what I want to hear. <laughs> the other thing you might be talking about is the excess bass on the fuzzy sounds. That's got a picture of me and Pino somewhere. That's have you? Yeah. That's just I, I wish I could honk. Oh, so you can. Honk I can Pino. honk Pino. Pino. That's one of the most satisfying honks ever. Um, He's such a lovely guy. If you don't know massive. who Pino Palladino is, please Google him. Um, you might be talking about the excess bass on the bottom end of the fuzz. Um, which yes is a is a valid point. It's rare that you would be playing those low notes with a, with a fuzz. Oh, man, that first volley of of fuzz on the on the uh, on your vlog, it's like it's like it's everything. <laughs> that was, it was pretty just uh, it, so great. Without wishing to be gloaty, it was a pretty epic sound, wasn't it that day? Um, Dan Drivers just sent me a, um, a secret engine or a secret machine, and I get them confused. Uh, which is kind of zonky, so it's more mid-range mid, mid -range oh, okay. focus, so right. you don't get that much, but it's really good. Going to get that on the show soon. Right. Um, Ryan Seacrest. Um, Big Shoots and Ty Roberts and Simon Dixon and Matt Elder and Nick O and TK Brooks wanted to know this too. What pickups were in blue for this episode? Uh, for the Booster episode, it was the old Seymour Duncan pickups. Well, was it really? Yes. Wow, well, okay. Uh, at least one person said, wow. Your guitar sounds so much better since the new pickups are in there. Actually, to be fair, uh, it did sound more articulate than it has sounded before, and I don't know. It, do, it did have a new bridge in it. Ah. For that. Okay. So. We can't I don't know. over that. Yeah. Um, in in the main show, tomorrow there's a there's a pedal jams that's going to go out, which is the old pickups, and then I think from Friday on, it's the new pickups. I mm -hmm. think. I think. Um, Narge. Penderslaw, mm -hmm. Narge Penderslaw. I think I bought some of that in Sainsbury's recently. It was good with pizza. What, the Narge or the Penderslaw? The, the Narge Penderslaw. Okay. Yeah. Have you noticed that stuff called Njuda? Njua? No. It's like a salami, a spicy salami paste. Njua, Njuda, something like that. Right. It's everything, it's everywhere now. Do you remember when salted caramel was the thing? So this is salami paste is the new salted caramel. Yeah, spicy salami paste, mine. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and it's on it. I've noticed it on everything now. So if you go into a restaurant, they've usually got something with njua or njudo. Really? Or it's called. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully someone will clarify. Uh, anyway, Narge Penderslaw, tasty, says, so aside from potential real estate savings, is there any advantage to a purpose-built boost over a, just a good old EQ pedal? I mean, hopefully, it's pretty obvious in the show. Um, so yes, the boosts are also limiting in their own way, and they each have their own voice and character, and really good at different things. I mean, the EQ pedal is an amazing boost if what you want is an EQ pedal for a boost. Um, if you need a little bit of grit or a little bit of hair on the top end or a little bit more compression or um you know or shaping or you know whatever each boost has its own character um the 
what the EQ's great at is it has loads of headroom. Uh, and so, and you can specify the frequencies that you want to use. Um, but it doesn't have any of its own limiting characteristics. You know, like, like a, the, the fire bottle is a really good example. It's this beautiful, um, you know, it's the, like a, a, a valve boost, but it has that, uh, the, the natural characteristics, compression limiting characteristics of the valves in there. And like an EQ pedal won't do that. Yes, I think um, Naj wasn't the only one to raise this question, and I think it points at the at a kind of a preconception of what a boost is, right? Mm. So most people just assume that a boost is a make, louder, just louder, just more, right? If I could offer an analogy, um, you need to plug your guitar into something to make it louder. We tend to choose guitar amps because they they're really nice, right? Mm. And we like them, and different guitar amps give us different sounds. It's exactly the same with boost pedals. It's not, a guitar amp isn't just a make louder device. It is a sonic coloring machine yeah. in, in its own right. An, like EQ, an EQ pedal in a way is the equivalent of a PA speaker. It's just kind of more mm. cleanly. Bigger frequencies and yeah. Without too much coloration, depending on what EQ pedal is and depending on what the circuit is. But if we just take EQ as general, you're just talking about more or less of different frequencies, which is what a PA speaker does. Mm -hmm. A guitar amp, does that, but it also gives you everything he just talked about. Different headroom characteristics, mm. different clip characteristics, different shelving in terms of EQ. So yeah, they definitely have a character. So It's always worth remembering that harmonically, the guitar is a really complex signal generator. There's so much going on. So when you look at, you know, things like sine waves and simple waveforms like that, the guitar isn't that. You know, so you can talk about, you know, how this how this pedal will work with a sine wave. Guitar's not that at all. Yeah. The, you know, it just the it's so complex, and uh, you know, if you think about what's going on with the phase relationships between all those frequencies and, and harmonics and stuff, it's it's amazing, and all of that when you pair that with the pedals, they give give you all this. Why we do what we do because what you can get out of it is yeah. so incredible um so yeah it's uh you know even even something just as simple as a clean valve boost what it does to the, all those complex harmonics is very different very different very different frequency so i'd be great to get somebody in one day and talk about this because you hear didactic statements like oh a guitar speaker doesn't produce anything above 6k anyway and and stuff like that because that's where the roll-off is but I promise you, if you record a guitar, um, uh, record some guitar and get a graphic and push the sliders up from 12k to 20k, you'll hear it. Oh yeah, you'll really, really hear yeah, it. Yeah. So it's all it is. I don't know how that relationship works, but it is fascinating. Yeah, I and mean, my Vox has got starts at 6k. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guy Bennett. Hello, Guy Bennett. Guy says, great show as always, guys. It's always intrigued me. When people talk about shaping and always on sound, like the example you used at the beginning, um, of taking a mid hump out of the Fender hot rod, why don't people just turn the mid down? Any reason? Doesn't it do the same thing? Uh, depends where the mid frequency is. So when yeah. we talk about a mid hump, uh, we're generally talking between five and 800 hertz. Mid hump is what Tube Screamer does in my world. So when we say it's a mid humped overdrive, it has a, a, a considerable boost, five to 800 hertz, which is where the Tube Screamer boost is, which is why on various um, Tube Screamer alike pedals, you'll see like the way huge, whichever the way huge one is, has got a little trimmer for 500 maybe. Right. Might be 800. Okay. Um, Whereas the mid control on the Hot Rod Deluxe won't be there. It will be somewhere else. Right. It will be a range of frequencies that is not right there. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind, when we're talking about mid-range, Franger, what would you call mid-range? Between like 300 and two, up to like 1K. Okay, so Fraser's saying very roughly for the purposes of this discussion, 300 hertz up to, a K. Up to 1K, let's yeah. say, in the, in, the, in the context of this discussion. Um... That's a lot of frequency range there. Massive. And if you, depending on what your cue is, like how narrow you want to put boost or cut, you'll hear a, just a phenomenal difference whether you boost at 200 or 800 mm. or cut 
at 500. Mm. And so an amp mid control will work over a range of frequencies somewhere in there. Yeah. Actually higher than that in, in some amps as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Is that an adequate answer, That's Daniel? Perfect. You said everything I was going to say. You said Q, thought a little tick box in there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Frequency magic. <laughs> right. Heath, Annette. Hi, guys. Uh, what's the difference between a preamp and a boost? Uh, is it just an EQ section? I use my pulp and peel as a preamp, but is it really just a boost? Uh, master? Machete. Machete. I also want to know this as well. Um, yes. But preamp is just an amplifier that goes before your amp. But it is, they are terminologies. You can use one or the other. Um, however, generally, uh, I say, uh, you know, there are, you can get cleaner style preamps, but you get really clean boosts. I mean, yeah, they're completely yeah. interchangeable. Well, you know, what does boost mean? It makes, make more louder. Yeah. And what does amp mean? It means amplify, make louder. Yeah. So, yeah they are the same thing and preamp just means you're amplifying something before something else but if you use it in your effects loop what is it then is it a post amp yeah i don't know but yes they're the same thing it just how it is achieved is P what's power. different yeah you know yeah but yes you, you know um boost preamps um drives to an extent they're all give me more make louder yeah. Um, yeah. More. More. Because more, better. More good is more better. More, more loud is better. More, more better. better. Metal thrashing Matt. Hello, Matt. Um, I assume the blues driver was chosen because it has a more neutral mid range character. Would it be harder to apply these rules to a more mid hubbed OD? No, same. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and then you would use whatever boost to shape that in some way. Yeah, and you'd be using that mid humped ID because that's the sound you want. Yeah. And so, yeah, use the boosts accordingly. Yeah, I think we use the blues driver because it's just a great all-round overdrive pedal that many people understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he gets two questions, is that right? What yes. Does the, what does the boost into the compressor do exactly that makes it feel like a pushed amp? Right, so... The compressor by its very nature, is limiting the amount of dynamics that you have. And with a, with a valve amplifier, the nature of the power section, the more you push it, the more that the power section naturally limits the dynamics. Now, if I push that compressor really hard, it's going to do, in the transistor world, a similar job to what happens when you push the power amp really hard. And limit those, you know, give us a lovely... Um, a lovely sense of uh, when you when you so that headroom goes, you're now into limiting um, the the notes. You can sort of lose a little bit of that attack, and it's sort of a bit squashier. But then you get this lovely smooth sustain. Um, <coughs> yeah, but actually, I was thinking about this: how we do a show on power amp overdrive. <coughs> Excuse me. We should have some water. We should have bought water. Even I'm a little horse today. <laughs> um, oh, good man, Fraser. Just some Chardonnay, thanks, bud. Uh, yeah. Some yeah. Pinot Noir. Pick, pick Paul de Pinot for me, please, with an oyster. Polyphony. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, what we're what we're doing? If you just stick your guitar into a compressor, there's you know your guitar's got so much grunt to give the compressor. If you stick an overdrive before that or a boost, then it's, there's more. Mm. Um, I'll tell you what's interesting about dynamics. Mm -hmm. So what a compressor is actually doing is limiting dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I always describe it as, as it feeling more dynamic to play because the action of actually playing gives you more squash and release. Yes. So that I've, I've got myself into, tied myself in knots on many times by um, describing using that sort of sound as a more dynamic feel. Right. So you're when it's actually less dynamic. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm talking about dynamics and I'm talking about uh, dynamics in amplitude. Yeah. So like for example, if you plug your guitar into a mixing desk, like or a PA or whatever, like so totally clean headroom and you pick light, you can pick light so you can't hear it. 
but then you can pick loud till you go like it'll blow your face off. Yeah. You know what I mean? So massive, oh, massive beauty. range. Oh look, he's, he's such a thank you for lovely his boy. With very good posture before I did note. That's because um, he's fit. Cheers, buddy. And careful not to show his face on camera as well. He's yeah. But that all changes that, soon. That day will come. Yes. Oh, that's better. Nice. No. Lovely. Just imagine if it was gin. Um, yes. Uh, so that's what it does. It's um, instead of your valves and amp doing the limiting thing, the compressor is doing it. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the same thing. No, no. But there, it's it's mimicking the dynamic limitation of a power session when it's pushed. Yes, basically. and because you're doing it after the boost, you're not losing any relationship between your guitar and the overdrive. Yeah. Whereas if you put the compressor first, your compressor's taking off the front end of your note, then it hits the overdrive. So then you get weirdness like you don't get very much overdrive on the first hit of your note until the rest of the, you know, until the compressor picks it up again. Mm. Mm. Very good. Uh, right. Aaron Montiel says, you guys need an SG with humbuckers. Yes, we do. Okay, team, open up your, a browser and go to Carter Vintage Guitars and search for a custom shop 61 SG Les Paul reissue in aged Pelham blue. Oh, dear. Please, somebody buy it. <laughs> somebody buy it soon because I look at it every day with a little dreamy, dreamy dream. So please, somebody buy it, take it away, take it off your market, a little dream and enjoy that SG. amazing guitar. Yeah. We really do need an SG. We, we had one for a while. We did. And it was such a... It got removed. It did, but it, it belonged to Gibson guitar. and Guitarist Magazine. And when I left Guitarist Magazine, it was no longer... So yeah, it, it went back. Um, we really do need a Humbucker SG. Yeah. It's, as regular viewers will know, I'm a great fan of the 335. Mm. I love those guitars, but I would say one of the only humbucker guitars I'm happy playing is an SG. Really, genuinely happy. And why I don't have one is insane. I used to go and see Paul Stacey play at the 606 in London quite a lot when he would... Uh, We're running 35 minutes plus on last week's cues. We're being told to hurry up. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Okay, Jonathan Mackey, very interesting episode. Would like to see some more detail during VCQ or mixed trick with the comp boost. Okay, we can't do that, Jonathan. Uh, we will do it in another. You wanted to know where the controls were. The level on the compressor was all the way up. The compression was down relatively low, but the really important thing was the level on the boost pedal was low. Or was, hang on, was that right? Or was the level on, either, either way round you get it, one of the levels has got to be really low to stop. Yeah, we were pushing the compressor hard into the boost. Yeah. what we were doing. Yep. Yep. Or we were the, pushing the, the, the boost really hard into the compressor and then having the compressor... The, the EQ at the end was right down. Yeah. So everything was pushed into the EQ at the end. Yes. Okay, forget what I just said. Boost, cranked, bit of compression, output on the compressor, low. That's it. That's it. Yeah, and yeah. the chorus, there's chorus there as well. Yeah, uh, anyway. Marco Raphorst, Chris Williams, what is that Gretsch-like guitar Dan is using? <laughs> It's very Gretsch-like. It's very, it's so Gretsch-like. Gretsch -like. It it's actually a, says Gretsch on the headstock. Yeah. Um, it's a Gretsch, and it has a um, maker number, model number of, it's a of players, a Gretsch, Gretsch a, guitar. It's a player's edition broad jet. Anyway, it's the jet with a V stop tail and broad Tron pickups. Yes. Okay. Think Magnificent thing it is. Yeah, yeah. Player's edition. Yeah, lovely guitar. Yeah, in really stunning candy apple red. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a beautiful thing. This uh, is the same guitar that we had in in Germany, right? Because so I think I borrowed this for the evening. And anyway, go. Oh, yes, check the video. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that is right. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Um, and the final question from last week's show, Mark. Uh, Nach Mias says, another exhaustive and exhausting video. I might just plug straight in. 
I like that. Some days that's the only way, Mark. Some days that's the only way. Right, let's pick up the live comments then. Come on, Shall I hold the machine down? You may. As soon as you have a guitar. There you go. Right, here we are. Hello, thanks to BV for moderating. For some reason, people seem to like trolling these things, which I don't know what's wrong with the world. But anyway, I, I won't moan about that. Uh, I may have to don my glasses for this is a small font. Oh, so Top Chat's turned on now. It is? So we can see all your comments. How do we, is it? Yeah, there it is, right there. Yeah, yeah, great, awesome. Uh, Matt Gilbert, hello Matt. Um, I only use a Tumnus after gain like Mick does with his silicon furs. Sorry, dude, uh, I'd get a decent furs. Uh, okay, this is a conversation that's happened before. Um, Mark Pritchard is probably answering a question about why do they call Dan's SG a Les Paul or a Les Paul SG. Uh, because in 1960, they discontinued the Les Paul that you know. Um, could you grab the Les Paul as well, please, Dan? This is a really interesting story for anyone who doesn't know it, actually. Most people do know it, but if you don't know it... Um, this guitar came out in 1952. It had different pickups and a different bridge here, and it was gold. Um, nobody liked it, nobody bought it, so they kept upgrading it all the way through. Eventually, in 1958, they said, tell you what, let's make it sunburst. They made it sunburst. They By that time, it had humbuckers and a bridge like this. Um, still nobody liked it, nobody bought it. So uh, they decided not to make it anymore. Les Paul had his contract upcoming. They said, tell you what, what we need is something more modern. Let's make it this. We'll call it the Les Paul. Les Paul said, you are off your rocker. Um, you can take my bloody name off that thing. And so- I've been uh, selling your demon guitar. The following year, it was called the SG. And that's how that happened. For They'd, standard guitar? Um, or solid guitar. Solid no, guitar. Nobody's quite sure. They didn't start making this again until 67? 68? No way. Yeah. Have you got it? I've got it. Yeah, yeah. And then it was very different when it returned because then it had mini humbuckers and it was called a deluxe. But that's why, I think. Um, this, so this is 1961, this junior, and you will still see it says Les Paul on the headstock. Ha ha ha. Yeah, so there we are. I love this guitar. Um, so that was Les Paul signature guitar in 1961, mm. albeit the junior model thereof. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That's how that works. Jeremy C. Hello. Jeremy. S speaking of dynamics, do you gentlemen have to work to make your friendship seem so effortlessly charming? <laughs> or is it just effortless? Well, you know, we like all relationships, we have date nights, we work hard on it, we make time for each other, you know, uh, all those things that you would do in a relationship. <laughs> oh, bless you. Um... Uh, okay, Fishy Paw. Um, that story had been disputed. His endorsement contract ran out. That's why they took his name off. Um, yes, his contract did run out. It wasn't renewed. I think it, he was, his relationship was with Morris Berlin, maybe, and Berlin left or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, he didn't like the guitar. He never liked it. That's why his never looked like the standard models. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Matt Stevenson. Hello, Matt. Love the show. Thank you. Following your episode recently in which Dan ran the ultra cheap amp into a 4x12 for decent tone, do you have any thoughts on converting cheapy combos into heads? No. It's not worth it. Hang on. But to, how, okay, but what are you talking? What's a cheapy combo though? Yeah. Ah, oh, man. Uh... Maybe, maybe. There's no doubt that changing changing the speakers into which you pump your amp makes a colossal fundamental difference in how the thing sounds. Yeah, definitely. So uh, what, what would be useful to say there? You know, if you don't want to drop however much money on a new amp and you think a decent different cabinet could help, then try it. And then if you love that, then yeah, chop it. Chop the head down into a... Chop the cab, chop the combo down into a head, and so I've I've done this before. Yeah, right. I had a wonderful uh, quad reverb that was stolen along with my Strat, and it was an epic sounding thing. But it was a it was a four by twelve. It was basically a Fender Twin, but a four by twelve version. And I thought, I'm just gonna, I just want the the head part, and I just run it into a one by twelve or a two by twelve. So I did, I cut the thing 
and it was stupid and I've done it a number of times, right? And it's it's it, it's an awful looking thing as well. Matt's talking about a cheap combo, Valve State Martial or Offender Frontman, etc. One day they will build houses out of that stuff. Instead of making landfill out of it, they will um, they will use it in construction. Right. A couple of bits of particle board each side, spray it with pebble dash. There you go. There's a nice affordable home for somebody. Built out of old Marshall valve states. Resonates at 67 hertz. <laughs> uh, uh, Nick Arms. Hello, Nick. Can you please tell me what budget pedal I can buy to make me play and sound exactly like SRV and Jimmy. <laughs> also, how do I plug my classical guitar into it? I wait your concise yet thorough answer. Um, this is easy, Nick. I think you need a tube screamer, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, you could buy the tube screamer uh, mini, which is 59 quid, I think. Right. And I think literally if you plug that into any amp, you'll sound just like SRV and Jimi Hendrix. At once? Yeah, as long as you wear the hat. Ah. Uh. It's the hat. Nobody knows that, you see. I like that. Yeah, yeah. That's where I've gone wrong. Uh, Corey Coppinger. Hello, Corey, or Corey. Hey there, lads. Thanks for all your help and willingness to share. People think I'm a rock star in pedal knowledge when I go into a music star, and that is thanks to you. Ah, very good. Nice one. Uh, Stuart. Hello, Stuart. Uh, Tate says, no question, just hello. Hello. Hey, Stuart. Is it us you're looking for? <laughs> uh, right, come on, come on, come on. Rydock. Mick, regarding the Catlin bread delays, the preamps in them actually seem to be fattening lows and mids, making the high end seem less. You really need to turn up the preamp level inside to keep the high end. Ah oh, man, I did it all, Rydock. I did it all. Mm. And there is no doubt it's um it's robbing some high end. The uh the I think it's either the Echo Rec. Yeah, I think it's the Echo Rec. It goes really boosty if you turn it right up. Oh, really? Like a really good overdrive. Wow, okay. Yeah, no, the fidelity's just not there, I'm afraid. And I don't know whether I've got a faulty one, but um, Interesting. Yeah, we'll do that show. Uh, right. Jason Clute. Hello, Jason. No? Hello, Jason. Speaking of tape delays, did you catch JHS's show recently on tape delay origins? Thanks so much for all your hard work to make my favourite show. Thank you, Jason. Um, yes. I, watched, I haven't watched it. I've watched Well, religiously watched everything. All Josh's it, stuff yeah, is all good. Josh's stuff. It's great. Yeah, it's wonderful. He's found a couple of got a couple of very rare things on there as well. He he has a worrying amount of gear. Like well, you know, he's in the rabbit hole, isn't he? he? Yeah, yeah. It's but it's it's yeah, true truly really wonderful. He's yeah. coming out soon. Oh cool. We have to be filming with him. Oh, as we're well. going to do the Tone Bender show. With any luck. That's the plan. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. Um Master Machetier, hello. Hello. Um love the MIDI episode a while back. I'm getting an MC6 and an HX stomp. I'd love to see an episode on in-depth in -depth MIDI programming and tips for live use. We did a show on MIDI, didn't we? We did. I was ill that day. You. Yeah, it's... um. That is really interesting, but it is literally like reading a product manual. Yeah, I think that I think then there are probably other people that will do that better than us. Uh, because every MIDI device is different. And also MIDI MIDI uh, 2.0 is coming out now as well, which is, so the, the MIDI um, protocol has been out for nearly 30 years now or something. I mean, it's crazy, mm. maybe even longer. God, I don't know, th think about it. Anyway, so they're updating it with MIDI 2.0, um, which does look really interesting. So maybe we'll touch on that when it comes out, but <clears throat> doing a show on MIDI programming, I'm, I'm getting tired and sleepy just hearing those words come out of my mouth um it's hard to make a show on midi programming yeah appealing um the, the functionality of it is clearly fantastic that's oh, amazing it's off it the revolutionized scale music yeah you know um but yeah it is a bit it's just a lot of manual reading isn't it yeah and this to that and that to this and Hold the pedal back and then press go. Do not collect two hundred pounds. Go home. I'm not going to say what I'm going to say next. Edward, Eduardo Sanchez, one twenty five. Hey, Eduardo Sanchez. I wonder if that's because you have a Gibson ES one twenty five. Might be. 
If it is, congratulations. Which one's that? Like Simon's old one in 56. Oh, like, oh there. With wow. the P90, Charlie Christian. Amazing. Christine. Yeah, well, actually, Charlie, Charlie Christian was a 150, I think. Anyway, whatever. Thank you for the endless inspiration. Quick oh, one. Bless you. I play a Roland JC40, but nice. it can be incredibly bright. Yes, mm -hmm. we found that, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. Um, other than less amp treble roll off, how can I reduce the brightness but keep the fullness? Didn't have a bright switch. You would know. You would have clearly have tried that if it does. Uh, User Catlin Bread Belly Pock Deluxe. <laughs> um, load your signal down. Do yeah, the opposite. EQ pedal. Do the opposite of what a buffer would do. So I don't know whether you're plugging straight in or you're going through a bunch of pedals that have really good buffers in. But for me, that unpleasant brightness is often as a result of a very heavily buffered signal. Okay. And you can get rid of some of that. I don't know how you get rid of it. Use a 120 foot high capacitance cable like Albert Collins. Um, that will get rid of some high end for you for absolutely certain. Definitely. Depending on what pickups you're using. I, I really like that. If you, if you can do it, yeah. I mean, A, time control here. Oh yeah, what guitar have you got? What guitar have you got, Eduardo? Please let us know. Um, if you've got a single coil guitar, um, actually, if you've got any guitar, you can change the value of your tone cap on the on the tone pot to something very small, mm. like an 022 or maybe even smaller. And then when you roll the tr when you roll the tone pot back, it'll only take off the very high frequencies. If it's a big value like 047 or one, you don't see one anymore, but. That's what was in the original strats, for example. Uh, it'll take off quite a lot of high mid range as well. So mm. if you've got a really small number tone tone cap on the guitar, uh, it will get rid of it. But yes, we thought it was a pretty bright amp as well. Yeah, which is exactly what you want for playing with a band, but not necessarily what you want um, when you're in your home or elsewhere. And maybe try a different speaker mm. as well. Yeah, I don't know. No, it's, it's two tens in it, I think. Yeah, that well, that's, to be fair, the original JC120 was extremely bright. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it's like Stephen Rothery uses that paired with his Marshall. Oh, astonishing mm -hmm. sound. Or as Dan was about to say, just get an EQ pedal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Right, what's happening here? Uh, ba, 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 ba. Right. Cheers, guys, from Barcelona, says Huli or Julie Matu. Uh, I have an exotic RC2 version 2, a Ryra, some sort of Timmy and a treble booster. Nice. Is this too much gain? No. And then it's just completely disappeared, as it always does. I took Joey Landreth to Barcelona to see Biffy Clyro. Or is it Perfect Harmony? Yes. Yes, yes. Great. Really great combination of pedals, actually. I mean, I, I would have thought if you've got them all on at once, it might be a bit too much, but <laughs> that's for Biffy Clyro. That's for Joey Landreth. Uh, I love Barcelona. What a great place. <laughs> a friend of mine who I used to, just to study with uh, when I was doing music, and he had a like gig the out there. <laughs> There's this guy I used to study with, a guitar player called Paul Seiler, the most extraordinary guitar player. And he had a gig at a jazz, um, a jazz place out there. Um, yeah, I have to see if he's still playing out there. He man, he was crazy, just the most extraordinary guitar player. But yeah, I love I love uh, Barcelona. So Barcelona. Uh, maybe he could answer question a question <clears throat> from Anton Nielsen, Dan, which okay. is um, what sort of treble booster would you recommend for an AC thirty with a hot cake? Oh, so okay. Uh, there's a uh, Fry. Is it Glenn Fry? Fry Electronics. The he makes Fryer. A uh, Fryer. That's him. Um, and he makes uh, Brian May's trail boosters. They're great. Uh, there's a, there's a number of really good ones. A uh, divided by thirteen used to make a trail booster that was just epic. I don't know if they're still making it. Of course, the Beano Boost by Analog Man is wonderful. Um, that's, a, that's a great thing about the, the Troll Boosters. Such a simple circuit, but every single one I've played sounds different. Yeah. My favourite is still this, though. 
The ones I get along with most are the ones that have got a switchable bass response. So you can take more or less bass out. And I think the yes. the Beano booster does that. And the Keeley one Java boost did it as yep. well. Java boost is epic. If he still makes it. Now this was from a company called Plosive Electronics, right? And Dave Gregory had one on his board and I heard it and I thought, oh, this is the most amazing sounding thing ever. So I contacted the guy and and bought one. And and I absolutely loved it. And I went to purchase another one and he disappeared. The website had gone. Was it officially sanctioned by anyone called May? No. But okay, neither, neither but all of his social media stuff had gone. He oh, just right. vanished. I'd have called it a June. Ah, very good. Or an April. So before or after. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, but this is still my favourite. Um, I, I adore this thing. It's, and it's really simple, but again, nothing sounds like it. And it has a capacitor array on here. So that tone control is just different capacitors for different amount of bottom end coming through. Yeah. And then... Wah. Yeah. But even if it's very... At, at, with the gain off, it's still boosting. It's an amazing sounding thing. But go for something that is uh, Range Master derived. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If you want that Brian May thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, Jem, or it might be Jamie. Uh, not all. Guys, do you have any preference tone wise regarding speakers wide in series versus parallel? Especially with a 2x12. Two tw two 8 ohms versus 16 ohms, do they sound different? So, um, for anyone not following, if you get two 8 ohm speakers and you wire them in series, how many ohms do you get, Dan? In series, you get 16 ohms. And if you wire them in parallel, how many do you get? Four ohms. There you go. So you're taking the same speaker and you're wiring it in series or parallel, uh, meaning that when you attach it to your amp, you've either got to select the 16 ohm tap or the 4 ohm tap. So the 16 ohm will be your amp is working harder. It's harder to push 16 ohms than it is to push 4 ohms. 4 ohms, that's easy to push, and so your amp will actually be louder. Um, so and they they do sound different. The amp, it, so it's not just about the speaker though. It's about the relationship between the amplifier and the output stage and the transformer. It's about the relationship between the amplifier and the speaker. They uh, they work together. It's just not the speaker um, reacting differently because to, uh, yeah because it's wired differently. It's the, it's the relationship between the amp and the speaker and the um, impedance stuff. Some amp designers I know say it doesn't make any difference. Look, it's many amp designers I know say it makes a massive difference. Yeah, if you're pushing sixteen ohms, it's harder to push sixteen ohms than it's push four ohms. Yeah, but isn't the isn't the transformer wired with that in mind? It's tapped off at a different point. So d d is there not a? But then, uh, hang on, let me get this right. Watts is the result of power, heat, ohms, and volts. Is it? How do you get watts? Watts is a is a, a measure of heat, basically. So, so you've got voltage m multiplied by. What I'm saying is, if you plug into your, if you plug into a guitar amp that's 50 watts, yeah, and you plug into the four ohm, the eight ohm, or the 16 ohm, mm -hmm. yeah, on a valve amp, you're getting 50 watts. If you do it on a transistor amp, yeah, yeah, but sorry, that's class that's, D amp. That's not a measure. Yeah, you're getting 50 watts, but that's that's a measure of the. That like the the power that related to heat in the amplifier. That's not a measure of the volume that it's producing. It's still it's still fifty watts. But if you're if you're well, look, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll get two eight ohms. Yeah, no, things. no, I agree. They sound very different. Yeah, eight ohms sound... is my preference, by the way, for right. for most amps. Um, uh, just because it always was. Sure. But if it's a super or a basement, then it's two ohms. It has to be. And if it's a Marshall head, it's sixteen ohms. There you go. And so, so the AC30 is wide in 16 ohms, and it's like, it's mega. Yeah. Sounds like a rabbit hole, doesn't it? It is a rabbit hole. But I want to know then, okay, so bring it back to relevance. Dan's just got the matchless ESD for his matchless. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the uh, and I'm assuming that is extension speaker double. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming. That's very or, good. Or I wouldn't have put that together. I don't know if it is or not. Someone can put me right on that. Um, it's currently wired in four ohms, and you're mm -hmm. saying the amp's too loud, so you might wire it in 16 just to see. Mm -hmm. Then that is the show we shall make. I like that. I like yeah. that. 
Funky Joe says, any chance of getting Philip Sace on the show? Would be great to see him. Yes, it blinking would. Uh, if Philip is ever in the UK, there is clearly an open invitation. Of course, that would be amazing. Uh, Christopher C, you guys are great. Oh, oh bless thanks. you, Christopher. Thank you, it's uh, very generous. Thank you for the entertaining and insightful videos. Well, thank you, Christopher. Thanks for watching. Um, just for, for anyone that, um, so the Super Chat is turned on and anything that we get from Super Chat just goes towards helping us pay for production and, you know, Fraser running around getting us glasses of water and yeah. things. He's got to milk that water from our water yak. <laughs> And let me tell you, that thing eats a lot of air. Yeah, so thank you to, to anyone that's done that. I really appreciate it. Matt Gilbert, Mick, are you reading any philosophy at the moment? Um, oh, yes, because some questions about the books. Which books were you reading in I, your vlog? I have listed the books that I was reading in the 2020 resolutions video. Um, and if you scroll through the comments, you'll, you'll find the links to that. Matt, I am still struggling my way through um, Alfred Adler's uh, on... Um, human Nature book, right from nineteen twenty seven. But that's been that's been a big thing for you. Everything. Adlerian, yeah. Um, old, 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 <laughs> Alderanian. Yeah. Well, it's nearly older, isn't it? So it works for me. Right, it's the body of my guitar, Dan. <laughs> um, uh, that and Eckhart Tolle. Now Eckhart Tolle might be seen as a bit of a modern day quack, but um, he's been important to me. So, and I, I, uh, I listened to that. And the um, uh, Futikame, forget his name, sorry, his Japanese dude, uh, The Courage to Be Disliked. And I have those on constant okay. play. And I, I'm on my 20th, 15th go through both books. Wow. Can almost recite them at this point. Listen to Pat Martino. Oh, yeah, in between Michael Landau, I there should say. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't listened to Michael Landau's Rock Bottom LP... Ah. Oh. Please listen to it. Yeah, yeah. I've been listening to it on loop for the last 10 days and I... It's just... See, here's someone that I would, I would <sighs> dearly love to get on the show. Because his relationship with gear is, you know, amazing. Like that, that, is it the 70s strat that he uses, the big headstock strat? 68. 68. Actually, I think he's got 68 and 69. Right. With the black one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the black one is. There's a black one and a sunburst one, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that and the, the, the pedals he uses and the amps he uses, just it was wonderful. Just wonderful. Carlo Maria Toller says... Ah, Toller. Um, hi, Mick. Hi, Dan. Hello from Italy. Hello. Ah. Ah, oh, Italy. Buongiorno is what you were looking Buongiorno. for. Buongiorno. Um, I watched your video about the Strymon Iridium and I was wondering if you think it's a suitable... Li it, suitable if it's suitable live... For a surfish clean sound with a strat. Um, yes, the deluxe reverb. Yeah, it's lovely. Would be great in it. Depends what you're going to put it through, of course, because yeah. you need some volume for that surfy sound. Um, and then you need like a really, really splashy reverb. The so all of those be... things are great depending on what you put them through. Yeah. And like, because you've got a, that, you know, that's, that's a pedal, it's not an amplifier. You've got to amplify that signal somehow so you can hear it. So for me, it always makes sense to take an amp, you know, because that's going to do the job. However, if you can't do that and everything has to go through the PA and they're going to give you fallback and in-ears or whatever, great. Yeah. But the basic, great. Tone of it, the basic tone of it. The basic tone of it is really good. good. Yeah, yeah, really good. Philippe Spectral, uh, is there a way to put vintage-style tuners on a strap without drilling holes? Uh, I've got Highway 1, quite similar to Chris Buck's, and I want to change the stock ones. Do you mean in the back of the headstock? In which case, no. There might be some that look like vintage style tuners that don't require the uh, the pin location thing. hole. Right. Um, and you just need to check the shaft width as well. Um, sometimes... Always check. A, a thinner <laughs> shaft doesn't fill the hole uh, as adequately. So you need to use a uh, a little collar thing to make sure that it all fits. <laughs> Hi guys, <laughs> <laughs> greetings, the greetings, <laughs> greetings from Rome. Says Domenico Lanza. Uh. Uh, will you ever do an episode on the different versions of the Hudson broadcast? Or the full tone, full drive. Yeah, we are going to do that. Um, 
uh, Hudson episode. I think that would be interesting. Uh, Fabio Rivola. Oh, we've got lots of Italians uh. watching today, which is very nice. Um, at the risk of upsetting the other 300 countries in the world. What's your favourite country, Dan? Italy. Me too. Uh, I'd move there tomorrow. Tube amp problem. Just... I'm hearing a pop like mini firework, and in the high frequency, it's really unpleasant. Are my valves exhausted, and do they need replacing, or is it another problem? Impossible to say, Fabio. So, <clears throat> some checks that you can do. Uh, if you're... Uh, if it's your preamp, actually, if you take a wooden pencil and very lightly tap the valve to see if there's one that's particularly microphonic, that's a really good one. But make sure it's a wooden pencil. Uh, chopstick's a really good one. Just very lightly tap it. Um, and that generally shows up if, there, if there's a particular problem with the valve. 90% of the problems are with the valve. If your filter caps are gone, uh, sometimes you'll see a spotting on the outside one of the ends of the, of the of the filter caps, where the um, the material inside starts to degrade. A really common one is like on on oh, blackface, not blackface, but oh, silver face fenders, um, and they've got the the electrolytics are in that under that tank on the outside of the chassis, and you can really you know, tap the, the the lid off so you can really easily see those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so oh, there's a really Good bet that it's the it's it's a valve, and after that, check your uh, your electrolytic filter caps. Yes, uh, a word of warning about poking around in the in, yeah, don't in do it. inside a valve amp. It's a really dangerous thing. Voltages can kill you. Um, so just take it to a tech. You know why? Try the valves first. Yeah, have a look at the because that's all right as long as you're just careful about making sure the amps off before you take them out, put them in, and all that. And it's because it's DC inside there. So mm. if you imagine your alternating current. Will actually throw you. But the DC is the same uh, the same electricity that we have in our system that that operates our muscles. So if you get if I'm holding something and you put DC in your arm, it'll actually you you grab. And that's the problem. If you've if you get hit with DC, you you'll grab it and you won't be able to let go. Mm. So it could be awkward. really really dangerous. So yeah, don't. Don't do anything that I told you to do. Awkward if you were grabbing a shaft, as Rufus1884 has, um, for example, the shaft of a, a pot or yeah, yeah. something else that you didn't want to let go of, let go says of Rufus1884. Thank you. Um, Jeremy Gum, uh, best or favourite harmonic tremolo? Are there any mini ones? Analog, I'd love to watch you guys talk about anything. Love the vlogs. Oh, thank you. Um, so my favourite harmonic trem is the Supro one, because it sounds like a univibe. Isn't that interesting? It sounds less like a harmonic trem. Um, the Walrus Monument is really good. The harmonic mode in the um, uh, Strymon... L not Lex, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the tremolo. Oh, what's it called? It's a reverb and trem, yeah, that one. Oh, Flint. Flint. Is really good. Uh, there's a few more starting to hit the market. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I like the Supro one because it sounds like a Univibe. Uh, the Walrus V2 is in a good size box. Yes. Walrus Monument. Um, are you right, Dan? Do you want to yeah, read no, this? no, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just... Um, Crown Jewels Guitar Repair. Yo, I have a 1x12 Pro Reverb that's 8 ohms. I want to do a 212 cab. Do you recommend I get two 4 ohms in series or two 16 ohm in parallel? If you get... Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, it's easier to find a 16 ohm speaker, I'd imagine, than... Yes, that's yeah. the correct answer. There you it go. is much easier to find 16 ohm speakers. They're very common, uh, so do that. There yeah. you go. Yep, yeah. well done, Dan. Uh, Carl Wine. Speaking of wine... Ah, uh, like a have box to eat of tonight? fine wine. Uh, that's a really good... You mentioned oysters before. Yeah. And... Should we go to my village pub again? Yes! That was ace! Yeah, let's do that. Okay, all right. Um, since the episode on EQ, says Carl Wine, I've used the GE7 at the front of my chain, boosting the bass and treble and cutting the mids some, think smiley face, and boosting slightly. No question, just thanks. Oh, that's great news, that's Carl. that's great. Well Thank done, mate. That's that. awesome. Um, yeah. Master EQ. So great. On the input. Do you remember... Shapes we, everything. We had, um, we had John... Uh, from 
Uh, Baroness. Carnival. Oh, Carnival. Carnival. Oh, blimey. John Stockman. John Stockman. <laughs> and Many. one for John from Baroness. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, so, and he had his, uh, his G7 at the end of the very last thing, just so that he could shape to whatever room he was in. Um, yeah, such a such a powerful little tool that thing. Did he have his modded? Because they're a bit noisy, aren't they? Like yeah, they can be the analog man mod in them is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Derek Clay, any opinions on the Drybell Unit sixty seven Boost EQ Range Master and seventeen seventy six Comp all in one small box? <sighs> what? I've never. Eat. That sounds really killer. Wow. Let's get one of those. Yeah, shall we? Uh, so yes, no opinion other than it sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> Rock Hammer says, have you ever turned your amp around backwards and placed the mirror behind it to reflect the sounds forward? It gives a glassy clean sound. Thanks, Rock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to say scissors. Um, Simon Mastromateo. Simon Mastromateo. Any thoughts on Goto 510 trim that's on modern Sirs like the Pete Thorne? Would it sound different from the vintage spec ones? Yes, sounds very different indeed. Uh, sounds good. Is that, yeah, well, I mean, it just depends what you want. Mm. Um, a lot of people say they don't sound any different. They absolutely do. Uh, a s classic Strat sound needs the bridge plate of that guitar to sit on the body. And, right. And the six screws, it's quite important uh, for that sound. However, lots of more modern Strat sounds, and if you take Pete as a really brilliant example of that, Guthrie, um, plenty of people use the two pivot bridge. Your Geordie friend. My Geordie friend. Matteo. Oh, Matteo Sassato, yeah. yeah. How are you, Luke? <laughs> Matteo Sassato here, coming at you, doing the internet, cracking. For, any, <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, Matteo Sassato is actually <laughs> from uh, from Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, yeah, they do sound different, which is not to say better or worse, it's to say different. Ah, uh, Reed Cunny plays some pretty guitar! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. Uh, uh, fishy Paws coming in with the jokes. I like Porky Pig philosophy. philosophy. I'm pink, therefore I'm ham. I wish I could make a Rennie Descartes pig joke there, but I can't, I'm afraid. Um... Right, uh, Alan Rutherford, and we are now all 13 years old. Yes, we are. When were we not 13 years old? Yeah, I'm still 19, I think. Oh, I'm about 27. Oh, yeah. I hey, to, guys. I had to grow up a little bit. Hey, guys, says Jonathan Harvey. I have a vintage JTM 45 type amp at 16 ohms. When running it through an 8 ohm hot plate into a 16 ohm 1960 vintage 4x12 cab, it sounds nasal, almost fuzz face like. Any idea why, that might, why this might be? Um, you got sorry. You got a sixteen ohm amp. He's running into an eight uh, ohm. Yeah, you've got a mismatch there, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. You need a sixteen ohm. Absolutely. Um, uh, hot plate. You might be damaging your output transformer doing that. Yeah. Possibly. Yep. Uh, Joe Brennan. Hello, Joe. Um, I can totally relate to your guitar wiring struggles, Mick. Um, I tried to do mine myself, but something was off so I had a pro do it and it transformed into a completely different guitar. Yeah, um I'm not hopeless at wiring. No, no, I'm you just was, no, really you, slow. You are uh, a perfectionist. Your wiring was fine. I saw it, it was all good. Thanks mate. I am gonna get some leaded solder though. I've got some for you. Thanks. No worries. Thanks. Uh, don't tell anyone. Uh Attila Ol Oliveira. Hey mates, cheers from Brazil. Oh hello to Brazil. Ciao What? Not in Brazil. Yeah, Charles. Well, Charles really? Goodbye. Yeah, hello, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I thought, yeah, Charles. Charles Italian, isn't it? Yeah, but it's also. Don't they speak Portuguese in Brazil? Yeah, but it's also Charles. Oh, nice, nice, yeah, yeah. nice. Uh, so, um, obrigado. I, I, I know Brazilians. I eat at Brazilian barbecue restaurants. Of course you do, yes. because of your fighting. Who are fighting? Um, Daniel's fighting. I just wanted to say, says Attila Oliveira. Um, <laughs> I had a, I had to go silent, and I've been hating what I get, but hitting an SP compressor with a bad bob brought it back some life into it. Thanks. Oh, great! That's amazing. Yeah, awesome. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. And I'm weird. Sorry that you've had to go silent. 
That is, well, I don't know what to say. It's a, it's a shame. Yeah, I think it allowed pub gigs are coming back. Uh, Rowan John says, hello from South Africa. Hello. Uh, in a church band and wanting to know which is simpler to use, individual pedals or multi-effects, as the multi can go straight into the PA and not have to carry an amp around. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I would... I don't know. It seems... I don't know. Don't really know that scene other than that it tends to be quiet stage and drenched in reverb. Is that too reductive? Um, Very maybe. high fidelity kind of sounds. It always seems to me like that's the church scene. Um, they're very different. There's some very different... There's lots of different scenes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if... if Whatever you find, you've got to for yeah. And look, it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you need, if again, if you've got to be silent on stage, then that stuff is really good because if generally those guys are using in ears. Uh, yeah. I just, I can't do it without an amp. You know, yeah. even even, um, I would sooner have. Like the, like a tiny little, um, ten watt thing, a smoky cigarette packet amp. Seriously, and tape it to my ears. <laughs> Let's do that, Jim Krantz. Hi, Jim. Love the show. Love the Boo See, Show. I decided to Wayne. Um, Kranz, sorry, oh. not with a T. Okay. Uh, I decided that I mostly only want to raise the volume when you, when used uh, when using a boost pedal. What are your thoughts on adding it after the humdinger and boosting only the dry amp? Yeah, great. Yep. It was, it was, yeah, it was, someone had mentioned that before. It's a great, great idea. Yep. Because um, then that would lift your dry signal up a little bit higher for when you do solos and stuff. Mm -hmm. Re it reducing the wetness, as it were, because it would be louder in relation to the wet amp. So mm -hmm. probably make it slightly more audible, mm -hmm. um, given that it's less weight. Um, Aaron Sab Saborin says, could the issue of the darkness in the Belly Pork Deluxe be because of the output impedance of the pedal? Yes, it could. I'm assuming it's pretty low, though. Yeah, it's going to be standard, I would have thought. Well, then it won't be that. Yeah. But theoretically, yes, Theoretically, yeah. So, yeah. sorry. Yeah, or indeed the input impedance, for that matter. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I want, to give, I want to give it a chance and make sure I haven't done anything dumb. Sure. We should, I think it's going to be an interesting show, though. Okay. Because when we had your tape echo plugged in, it was like, oh, I can't. Yeah, but that's I can't that's live what without this. That's what happens. It's every time we do that for the... You know, Larry 201, or even with the, um, when we had the Echo Rex and Sting plugs in, it's just, it, it's like, okay. <laughs> Ty Roberts, thank you, Ty, says, Mick, the church scene is mainly about sounding like you too and being pretty quiet. I use a stereo amp setup, but it's not loud. Well, it's nice Fair to enough. know there's still amps going on out there in the world, whether you're in church or not. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of friends in, in that scene and a lot of them are still using amps. Oh, that's cool. Mm. That's good to know. Cody Carrig. I want a video game where you, <laughs> where, where, you, where you play as Dan fights various builders and players to reach the magic transistor at the top of the mountain. The TPS role play game. Brilliant. Oh, that's awesome. Who would be, who'd be at the top? I reckon Brian Wampler would be challenge. Yeah. He, you know, he's quite fit. Yeah, I don't want to fight Dave Freeman, that's for sure. Simon Mastra Mateo says, Hi again for Dan. Um, Simon, hello again. How is the matchless cab? How do you like it? Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's just wonderful. Whenever I'd plugged into... Uh, I had an experience just with a head and the cab before. Whenever, but whenever I played the matchless 2x12s and they have the mismatched speakers in there and... They've just, it just gives this sense of uh, massiveness. It's a, it's the weirdest thing. And as soon as I plugged in this tube, I was like, oh, there it is. And it just sounds so huge. I just love yep. it. I haven't, I haven't heard it sound better than the HK yet. So we need, oh, to okay. do, we need to do that and have a listen. Okay. 
I wonder if it's because the HK is closed back and there's just more base reinforcement. Right, OK. But uh, And also those greenbacks in that cabinet have, have been, been whacked yeah, yeah, yeah. for years. I think it needs to be played in. Yeah, so but yeah, we will, but that we'll sense know of, in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. That, that sense of bigness, though, I do really like. My two-rock cabinet has changed fundamentally since okay. we got it. Right. Yeah. So... Uh, old Man Zen says, if you haven't got a high from Canada, let's get out of the way. Hello, Canada. Hello. Um, now then, uh, is the new Boss EQ worth the investment as it's not cheap? If it does what you want it to do with all the presets and options and things, it's great. Yeah, there's some really good programmable EQs out there. Does Source Audio make one? Source Audio makes one. They've got a... Um yeah, they, well, yes, they, they definitely make one. I they've got a new one. Free the Tone make one. Free the Tone one is great. Analog, programmable one. They've got the Condor from Chasebus Audio, which is, again, wonderful. Uh, there, there's a bunch of really good EQ options out there. But the Boss one's great. Uh, Manly S, Manly's FC. Manly's FC. Hi from Norfolk. Thanks for the content every week. It has changed my playing so much. Can't wait to play every day and experiment. It's awesome. And the options you guys have described so aptly blows my mind. Well, ah, thank you. That's amazing. That's oh, you're so kind welcome. Say. Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, we're learning all the time as well. Absolutely. Still still learning stuff. Sometimes you'll say something and I'll be like, wow, wow. Never knew that. <laughs> wow. What, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? Right, we should think about it, Dan. Okay. It's half past six. Um... Uh, Rob Flax, hi Rob. Um, ever think about doing a show about pitch shifters, especially octave yes, down? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, but there have been. Uh, yes, there's a there's a there's a couple of really interesting devices now out there that does that. So uh, there'd be a really good show on that. Yep, I've never. I I need some learning to do. Okay. Because pitch shifting isn't something I've never tried. Oh, it's great fun. Yep. Yep. Uh, Robin. Hello, Robin. Do you guys have any simple tips on how I could annoy my neighbours less <laughs> with my 6-watt matchless SC Mini? I live in an apartment and would like to reduce vibrations and noise. Robin, honestly, a 6-watt matchless is crazy loud. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you could hear... 102 dB with that thing, no, yeah, yeah. no problem whatsoever. Um, no, sound proofing is really expensive. To do pro soundproofing properly, and you've really got to have an isolated yeah. room within a room. It's you, really you tricky. You could try something like an ISO pad to reduce bass reflections through the floor. People like Aurelex will make like a foam pad. Mm -hmm. In fact, Bonamassi Bonham used to use those for his 412s. Did he? So they gave him consistency from stage to stage. Okay. Great idea. Um, so you could look at something like that, but not really. I mean, you know, if you, for example, in our little studio here, we've we've done a good job of really dampening the walls down with things like theatre cloth, um, various insulation in the windows, like literally insulation, multi-layered insulation mm -hmm. like that in the windows. But guess what? It all goes out through the roof. Yeah. So there's people stood in the car park going, hmm, now that is music. <laughs> I think is their main. That's what they say mainly, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. As opposed to, please, can you turn that garbage down? We've been very fortunate. Yeah. As opposed to our last studio, where um, yeah, neighbours were signing off ill because it was so loud. <laughs> uh, John Miklosovich. John Miklosovich. Hi, John, and thank you for that. Um, I'm building a wet-dry stereo board, and I just wanted to thank you guys for the vast amount of information you've put out. It's helped me tremendously, and I appreciate you more than you know. Well, thanks, John. Thank you, John. That's fantastic. And at, at the risk of a small tear, we appreciate everyone who watches this show, because yeah. it makes it possible. Yes. We had, we've, um, we're we we doing some gigs in April with uh, Senior Andy Timmons. And whenever we do gigs, like the last time we played was with Joe Landreth. And sometimes it's, you know, we're sat in here with the room, in the, you know, our little room, and we've got Fraser, we've got Simon, and that's our world. Could you be know? worse. And it could be worse. I mean, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. But when we get out and um, 
meet people who watch the show and real humans, real people. <laughs> it's yeah, it is as opposed to yeah, a thousand great. YouTube comments. Yeah, but for you which are we're very e grateful. Yeah, we're very actually. Thank you to everyone that's that comments. We're so you know we read every single comment. We're really grateful for them, um, and you know everyone that watches the show. It's mind blowing. Indeed, we are right, Pieta Hendricks. Um, Pieta Hendrick uh, is Hendrick with an X on the end you're right um, hey guys love the show I'm thinking about getting a new Fender amp which one would you recommend Hot Rod Deluxe or Deluxe Reverb eee, that's difficult I, I'm gonna say Deluxe Reverb me too it's just a, <clears throat> it's a sweeter sounding thing yeah it's a nicer sounding thing in my in my opinion um the Hot Rod Deluxe has more clean headroom. Mm -hmm. It's more brutally loud in a band situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the Deluxe Reverb is more vintagey sounding. The reverb's nicer. Yeah. What are some other some of the and it's and it's got tremolo. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and, and it's got. <laughs> that was terrible. <sighs> Oi, slow trim. Like this. <laughs> Andrew Nuttall. Hi from the USA. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Um, what's the best tape echo, real tape echo, to buy these days for re reliability and tone? Well, there's a couple of really good ones. The full tone one's great. Yeah. Echo Fix is fantastic. Um, uh, Those are the only ones we have experience of, really, aren't they? Yeah. Either, so, yeah. Yeah. You might be. You won't be upset with either they all, they, of those. they do all take upkeep, though. You need to clean that. Those gotta heads clean the heads. The... Got to look after the tape. All yeah. that stuff. Yeah, the full tone one makes that fairly easy because of the way they've done the cartridges. Mm. But I because believe. of the cartridges, the tape will, will wear out quicker. Is that right? There's a lot more tape in there. Right. These. So the echo. If you, so you imagine the full tone is like a really good um, echo plex, whereas the uh, echo fix is more like your RE two hundred one. Yeah. Uh, Max Carton Guitar says, did Dan buy the vintage telly in the end? I have done a deal where I am purchasing. Yes. Actually, I've got to sell this guitar. Yes, we're just trying to raise the money. So we're selling this and the Jaguar and a bunch of other stuff, which will go up on the That Pedal Show store at some point when we've got time to do it, which ought to be soon because Pete's going to be wanting his money in the end. He is. But now it's like, it's like you with a tape delay. Now I've played that guitar. It's like I can't not, you know. And this is don't get me wrong. I'm gonna, miss, I'm really gonna miss Butters. It's been wonderful, but wow, that guitar is like, whew. yeah. So yes, I'm definitely purchasing it. Seriously, can't stop playing it though. Happy days. At home, it's like I'm playing it most of the time. It's wonderful. Um, I don't know what the kids are doing. G Barge, hello G. Um, hello from North California, guys. I hate to be a broken record, but I would love to see Dan's face playing into a magnetone Twilighter stereo, uh, pitch shifting vibrato, um, alternating in stereo. My giddy aunt, he says. Yeah, we played a vintage magnetone when we did the vintage guitar show, and it was truly a moving thing. So mm. we just need to work out a way of getting one of the new ones. Maybe we could phone Billy Gibbons. Yeah. Yeah, as a survivor. Yeah. You be me, I'll be Billy Gibbons. Uh, uh, ring, ring. Have mercy. It's <laughs> <laughs> very good. This is Billy Gibbons. Billy, we, are, we're, we want to borrow one of your amplifiers. Now, come on. Seriously. It's about time. <laughs> Jesus just left Chicago. <laughs> have mercy. Bye. Billy says we can't have one. Uh, that was lame. Um, I used to use a Boss PS3 pitch shifter delay as a chorus, says XA Smith. Yes. You can Wonderful. set one voice a few cents flat and another a few cents sharp. Yep. A nice alternative to a moving chorus. Oh, yeah, cool. Yep. Really good. Yeah, yeah. Another thing the uh, in the whammy where you can set it in detune mode for the chorus, it sounds fantastic. But my whammy isn't here. Because? Because I gave it 
to John from Oh Baroness. yeah, from Baroness. John he Basley. was touring it. He was touring and Basley. John Basley. He was touring and his one uh, broke, and I gave him one for the tour. And he ended up home, and I said, "Well, thank you for coming on the show. Here you go. Here's, here's a you digital one. You, well, you keep it. You keep that. Son. You keep. Yeah. You you, you keep you, that. You, you keep those bananas." <laughs> uh, Andy Meller says, th- "Adding my thanks for all the knowledge. Uh, is there any love for the harmonic percolator as an alternative fuzz? We." Had the uh, Frederick effects one on, didn't we? Yeah, we did a while back. Somewhere. It's yeah. up there somewhere. Um, um, yes, is the answer. Yeah, it yeah. was a real unique sounding thing, yeah. wasn't it? it was awesome. Yep. Um, right, Dan. Let's take one more, and okay. then we're off. Uh, we got both those ones. We do. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> do, 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 do. Uh, come on then, one. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. One last question. Who's got? A, who's got one last awesome question for us? Uh, uh, diatonic dude. Wow. Could a show cover the use of valves and how phenomena such as transconductance? Anode current, etc., produce a harmonically different effect in relation to note and the position in which it's played. Yes, uh, tricky to film. Unlikely to and be a tricky. Show on, yeah, yeah, tricky to get all that across. There are. We would need a scientist for that, and an oscilloscope probably would. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting that stuff. You know what? I was talking to Jesse Hoff yesterday, and Jesse. So um, people don't know Jesse from Lazy J at the Fires. Uh, he's, he's such a great guy. And he knows tweed amps like better than anyone I know. And often, he, like, he repairs um, amps for Pete Townsend and for, um, like, it's just, all the, you know, name anyone and they use tweed amplifiers because he's that guy. Yeah. So I'm trying to organise next time he gets a, a load in of like an old basement and stuff to come on the show. Yeah. And we have at it. Let's totally do that. Yeah. Okay, final question then from Rico USA. Hello, Rico. Uh, where did you buy your pedal shelving? Uh, we made it. We made it. Yeah. Uh, uh, These. To, to close the show this week, goodbye. Um, I'll give a quick tour of it. Is that going to fall off there? Actually, before I do, I would just like to show you my new uh, Schmidt Array SA350 board, which is bigger than the SA250. I'm attempting to get all the things I need onto this, Dan. I like that. I like your... This feels like the perfect size for me. Can't fit G2 on it, no. which is a bit annoying, but can fit a QMX4. Okay. And um, who knows what could fit on there in the future. That's cool. Uh, right. You'll have that for the Andy gigs, will you? Um, for the Andy gigs, yes. Okay, awesome. For the other gigs I'm doing in July, I might need something a bit bigger. Right. Dan made these out of wood. Hang on. These are that pedal shelf. Oh, wow, is it mobile? Yeah. Are you kidding? No, no. Here we go. This is awesome. Brace yourself. This is where those pedal shelves began. Dan made these out of uh, bits of wood screwed together. Uh, the backing is reclaimed pallet wood sliced into really thin bits, and mm-hmm. you can buy it on the internet. Waffer thin. I got it from Etsy. I got it off Etsy. Can you believe? And then we just we just bang that up to the back wall. These things, these are scaffold boards mounted on uh, scaffolding tubing. We made those the day we moved in, pretty much, didn't we? Um, these are deck boards so what you would put outside of your patio doors if you had a deck and these are also scaffold uh, things they they tilt back a little bit so that the so that when you have something like a fuzz face for example you see that so it can't fall forward and damage your um, 1961 Fender Stratocaster or any of your other Fender Stratocasters or indeed whatever else is there so yeah I'm really proud of this this is just like slap wood, I think they might actually be floorboards from B&Q, and we made that. Um, yeah, and then you just finish with disco lights. A 
That's how to do it. See you next week. Bye. Bye.